Hey, Richard. Richard. Hi, uh, hi, Benji. No, I was going to say, I love your podcasting uh, microphones now. You, yeah. You're real <laughs> pros now. <laughs> yeah, that's all it takes. All right, here we are. Okay. Welcome to soon-to-be listener-supported Awakening Lands. Wink, wink, and end. And part of Anna and Benji loving sharing regenerative stories studios. Here we're trying to see and serve the essential leaders and weavers working to unlock an ecological paradigm. That's you know, really given me the foundation, I guess, to um, want to include people, help people to belong by those, you know, that guidance, seeing the importance of others and feeling it myself to know the, um, the pain when you, when you don't feel included. That, you know, that really drives me to um, yeah, include other people and to, uh, to help people to feel that they belong, that they, they matter, and they all have something to, uh, yeah, to contribute. As you can hear, Richard Coates is a connector at his core. Foundational experiences early in life made him painfully aware of the realities of disconnection and of loneliness. His response has been to become a real champion for belonging. This has led him to a career as a psychologist with a private therapy practice, and to discovering and becoming part of the acceptance and commitment therapy and pro-social communities. We'll talk more about all that. He's also diving into the regenerative movement and exploring the central importance of creating spaces in our places where we can reconnect to each other and to the land. So how are you feeling today, Richard? Feeling uh, all kinds of stuff, really. I'm, uh, I'm excited to be here. I'm nervous to be here. Feeling connected to you both. And um, yeah, I'm really connected to um, the River Thames, um, where I live as well. And as we've done, we start with gratitudes. We talked a little bit in previous conversations about creating new spaces to open up new possibilities. Gratitude just challenges our limiting beliefs by sharing in a gratitude practice together before we talk. Um, you know, we're intending to infuse the conversation with positivity, optimism for the present, for the future, and hopefully that comes comes out through the conversation as well. I'm uh, I'm grateful for where I live you know, on the River Thames and just this morning being able to take a, a five minute walk from my house to cross the, the main train line between London and Bristol and everyone commuting on their way to work to step down some steps to the bank of the River Thames and be there pretty much by myself and uh, it was a misty morning with the sun just rising and just that mist coming off the river and uh, the reflections of trees on the uh, the water surface in this autumn time with the light and these prehistoric looking cormorants flying around my little uh, black pterodactyls um, yeah and just the sound of birds this morning that that was just uh, a beautiful place to walk to within five minutes and um, yeah so grateful for that for the start of my day Anna, what, what about you? I'm actually really grateful for for Zoom and technology, which is um, a little different for me because I spend a lot of time on Zoom. So I'm typically like Ugh, another Zoom meeting. But, you know, this morning I was speaking to someone in Tanzania and now I'm speaking to Richard in the UK. And later today I have um, a call with Chris Casillas all the way out in Arizona. And it's just really incredible talking to so many people around the world in, in one day and especially talking to people who really bring you along with them where you feel like you are part of their community or you can envision where they are. So I'm very grateful to connect with them. How about you, Benji? I'm grateful for your Zoom stamina. <clears throat> Let's kick this conversation off. Yeah. So Richard, one of the first things that we started off exploring the backstory of Richard's deep care for the well-being of others. He shared how, to him, a lot of it started in primary school, where he found himself in a rather awkward situation. Beyond the age of eight, the school he attended became a girls-only school, and in his final year, there were only three boys left. And it just so happened that Richard was left out. It was a hard experience. Yeah, there was one boy who was 
you know, more dominant and the leader in that context. Uh, he used to find it a fun game to run off with the other boy at sort of break times. And uh, and I'd spend my break times wandering around. Um, I can remember the path of conifer trees now out from the, the you know, the classroom. And uh, they would be hiding behind some of these conifer trees somewhere. Yeah, I just remember that. that you know, it's still very vivid in my in my mind, really. It, that's painful, and I felt that in other parts of my life, and I can empathize with other people who've, who've felt that. This is the event that Richard points to in describing how he learned the pain of loneliness. But there is another origin story that he and his family share to describe his empathy for others. It all started so simply, in a flash, when he and his mom were walking together, and she noticed that when passing someone, Richard didn't say hi. Yeah, that, that just showed the importance early on to think about other people, the impact that your actions or inactions might have on other people. Yeah, and just how important that is to recognize people so that they, uh, they feel seen. And um, that's you know, really given me the foundation, I guess, to um, want to include people, help people to belong by those, you know, that guidance, seeing the importance of others and feeling it myself to know the, um, the pain when you, when you don't feel included. That, you know, that really drives me to um, yeah, include other people and to, uh, to help people to feel that they belong, that they, they matter and they all have something to, uh, yeah, to contribute, you know, that they are, um, yeah, they, are, they are here and they matter. They're social creatures. With such a deep care for people, it may seem like it was inevitable for Richard to become a therapist, but it actually required a bit of luck for him to discover that possibility at all. I, I, I was very fortunate to find out about psychology. I, I did languages at school. I did French and German. And I guess with those languages, there was something about liking people, liking speaking to people. I'm just so grateful for doing a two-week course in psychology. There was something about that that kind of drew me in. I was I was curious. I don't I don't I didn't really understand, you know, what it was all about. But so there was that curiosity and um, something really fascinating, capturing about people, really. And um, yeah, that that kept moving me forwards. Skipping over a few of the chapters of Richard's life, we will rejoin him working at the National Health Service in the neuropsychology department. And each year there was a tradition of uh, going for a walk. And that walk was was often along the River Thames. And that was a chance to connect with people who maybe you didn't get to see, you know, the rest of the year. And um, there was one psychologist called Angus. He was, you know, he was a really great guy, Angus, who on this walk just told me about ACT. ACT stands for Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. While it's a simple framework, it's also so much more. ACT has just totally transformed my, my life. Yeah, now, now life is just totally different. It has got so much richer, complex. ACT offers a simple framework for seeing and navigating life's challenges and complexities and continually taking steps towards what we value and who we want to be. It helps us to cultivate psychological flexibility it's something that you embody a lot in your life, in your work, which is recognizing that things are going to be hard. There's going to be a lot of um, barriers that you come across and uh, a lot of emotions that come up, but still moving towards your values and what's important to you. So you're nervous about being on a podcast, but you're here and you're speaking your story because it's important to you thinking about, you know, your mind pushing you around and hooking you and pulling you in different directions and values. It's about connecting with what matters to you. And then the nature of values, that it's about uh, helping you to create a, a broad and ever-evolving set of behaviours. And um, and that's that's just been my life since connecting with, with ACT and connecting with what matters to me that um, connection with people is hugely important that learning is hugely important and that creativity is hugely important to me amongst others i could see the connections with work 
I work with a lot of like young adults who've usually had really negative experiences of, of school and authority. Yeah, and then suddenly they you know they have to see this this psychologist and uh, they often don't want to do that and that just led me to um to experimenting which which is at the heart of act as well it is it is all about experimenting trying things out and added to my already kind of creative ways and creative sort of experience from other people about working with people just to take it up to another level and I come home and tell my wife some of the stuff that I've been doing. And, you know, she said, that that's work. Yeah, that's just led me just to keep on following my heart and uh, seeing where that, that takes me, even though my mind is going to say, um, you know, you can't do this, you know, you're not good enough. And just keep, keep on reaching out and, and connecting. There's now an entire community coming together to practice ACT. When I found the ACTS community, that was probably professionally where I first felt that I belonged. It's just a, such a, um, a beautiful group of people who are able to feel how they feel and to share vulnerabilities, to, uh, to share that they all feel like imposters too, and, uh, and that's normal. The ACTS community is so welcoming. I have never met a professional community that is so open to being vulnerable and open to innovation and new people coming in and being flexible. It's not about egos. It's not about awards. It's not about publications. They deeply care and uh, it's their purpose to, to help reduce the suffering of people in the world. Reducing suffering. Yeah, alleviating human suffering. We can all do so much more when we share um, our knowledge and our experience and then pro-social is you know just came out of that that journey it was it's worth pausing here to say a few words on pro-social it's sort of a big deal in my personal experience my first impression was that it's yet another framework to learn but after hearing over and over from people how transformative it can be i eventually put some time into understanding what it is and becoming more familiar with it I came to see that it's actually quite dynamic, that it's a constantly evolving and maturing living system and library of knowledge and practices that can guide the way towards greater human collaboration and, well, being pro-social. Now, back to Richard's story of discovering pro-social at a conference for ACT, in fact. I was waiting at the bus stop to go down to, uh, to see the poster presentations um, you know, one evening. And there was a guy walking towards the bus stop and with, you know, maybe my mum saying, you know, always say hello to everyone. And I said hello to this guy. And uh, this guy turned out to be someone called Stu Liebman. He just got out his, you know, his, his mini like slide deck, his one minute presentation of pro-social and, and went through pro-social on the bus going down to the conference. And that was the first I'd heard of it. And, uh, and again, I just knew there was something in this to follow up and... Um, and there was a bit of a buzz in the conference about pro-social. And then the end of the conference was a, was a, a workshop on ACT and climate change. And um, in ACT, it's really important to, uh, to take action. And my action was to sign up for the pro-social facilitator training. For a lot of people, when they discover the state of the world, it can... Uh, lead to paralysis, mm -hmm. to an inability to really move at all. I think that your understanding of ACT, your ability to follow your heart, your inclination to create belonging, helped you to navigate that. I think that the way that you responded to learning about the, the challenges of the earth uh, has really given you a lot of energy. Kind of like you know, go back to the uh, the acting and the movie, you know, metaphors. There's there's so much you know special effects going on that we just you know we just don't see. And uh, people who can show things that you weren't aware of, um, I wasn't aware of you know the the amount of plastic pollution in the in the oceans and the the rivers before David Attenborough started showing those those programs on the on the BBC and. Uh, you know, with reading the Jem Bendel paper, 
and that is a yeah that's a really scary scary paper i guess when you uh you know you you hear about climate change in the state of the planet and it seems as though that's a distant thing that's you know it's going to happen in the future and then it's like yeah actually this, this could happen really soon and really quickly and um uh with that you know that fear um awoken in me really and um and just a, a feeling of disconnection as well just wandering around seeing people just doing the same day-to-day -day stuff um just feeling disconnected from them that you know and angry and you know how can you how can you do this stuff uh, that doesn't seem important and um and knowing that what i was doing with it wasn't helping with act it's it's being aware of your behavior and um yeah, whether it is it is helping to make your life feel, you know fuller and richer and more alive or whether it is you know it is eating you up um it is making your life smaller and making you feel more disconnected and um and so with with acts and pro-social i knew it was about taking taking a different form of action and then gradually sort of um yeah kind of coming through that um that real sort of deepest depths um where you really fall and um heidi stelzer talked about this in her um seminar of a pro-social world where you you fall and uh and that is really really important uh yep. like fa like failing mm -hmm. uh because you yep. come out the other side as a different person uh you heal and um maybe your yeah you know, your priorities shift and uh the people you spend time with what you focus on what matters shifts and uh, you can start to heal and uh start to connect and start living again and um yeah that you can still hold all of that pain and still uh choose to uh, to create um yeah, to yeah, create life in each other and where we live and um yeah and find joy moving forwards. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the Pearly Sustainability Group and stepping into that leadership role to invite your neighbors to get together to form a group that brings value to the community. Being inspired by um, David Sloan Wilson, who's one of the co-founders of ProSocial, and him using ProSocial in his neighbourhood for the neighbourhood project, and David Attenborough influencing me, and yeah, two two Davids, I don't know, and lots of other people. And, in addition um, to the abundance of inspiring Davids, Richard shared a couple of other reasons for starting the group. One was simply that he and his wife were new to the area and wanting to weave themselves into the community. We'd moved steadily upstream along the River Thames from, from Reading to this place. Not knowing anyone here, I was really aware of the research around loneliness and how loneliness is as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So Richard and his wife knew that they had to get involved. They spent some time exploring the existing groups and activity in the area for how to do so and how to best bring their particular gifts. The other sustainability group that had been in existence for about 10 years beforehand, they'd offered to uh, to amalgamate us into their group, but I just knew that wouldn't be enough. And so why don't we just, you know, set up our, our own group and some fertile soil to uh, you know, plant plant a seed in. And uh, it was the willingness that came with with ACT as well. So just try something out to experiment with it, but it might not work, and that's okay. And it was a values move. And as I'm sure you community workers out there are well aware, it's essential to have reliable and ever-welcoming spaces for our places. And in that, Richard and his wife found a great partner. And another kind of key local relationship with the Mad Duck Cafe, which had set up purely to kind of create that connection within a village again by two wonderful people, Mandy and Donna, who wanted to recreate what it was like when they were younger. You know, they were supposed to close at 4 p.m. They were willing to stay open till 7 p.m. on a Friday so that we could meet there. That's that's how committed 
caring they were. That that's how it how it all started, with the context of other people doing great work here already. Yeah, and I just put out a friendly message on our some of the other local Facebook groups, saying what I wanted to do, inviting people there. Yeah, about eight people turned up on a Friday night at seven thirty p.m. in this this community cafe, and that was the first step to kind of getting to know other people here and to to feel a part of this this place. When talking with Richard about his relationship to place, there is yet another experience that can't be left out. Uh, always a man of action, Richard joined another community of practice called Regenesis. And this one focused on learning the art and science of regeneration. The Regenerative Practitioner Program, or TRP, as I've often heard it referred to endearingly by some of its graduates, was another transformative experience in Richard's life. I didn't really know what it was about. Again, it was just you know, following my heart, following those, those connections. It was something completely different. I didn't know about systems thinking before Regenesis. It's kind of unlike anything else you do, just in terms of how it gets you to reflect about uh, you as a person, where you live. It, yeah, it was a, an, an eye-opening transformational experience. And, and through that, we had to um, come up with a project, a concrete example. And I was in a, I was in a little study group. I, I'd, I'd become aware of this project on the River Thames called Reading Hydro, which was about putting two giant Archimedes screws uh, into the river to, to generate uh, sustainable energy near me. Yeah, that, that just shouted out as a really good example to focus on. You were, you were wanting to look at a project. What could it add to look at it in a regenerative lens? You need to look, you know, at what comes around that, you know, the community around that. Uh, and then, the, you know, the greater whole, how that, you know, then benefits the landscape. And then that got me to really uh, learn more about where I lived. That really ignited curiosity in me. And so I would spend ages looking for like local resources. I, I found um, a local um Press that uh, that printed books around sort of the you know, quirky things where I live. Um, we interviewed people at Reading Hydro and uh, learned more about it. Um, and I just started to think more about my landscape then. And, and that was the first time I came across bioregionalism as well. I hadn't heard of it before that point. So yeah, doing regenesis like ACT again just transformed my life the level of detail that you now know about your place is pretty amazing. I'm wondering if you could share a little bit of that knowledge. Mm. Yeah, let's hear your your inner David Attenborough. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Benji. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> I have never heard anything like it before. Guess it, it all stems back to uh, to connection. That um, Reading, the town where I am, wouldn't be here if two rivers hadn't have connected here. That everyone knows the River Thames, and there's also the River Kennet, which is a beautiful chalk stream. And Reading is the place where these two rivers converge. It's a confluence of rivers. The river Kennet allowed for gravel deposits, which then allowed people to graze their animals. If the river Kennet hadn't have been here or did have, you know converged somewhere else, then Reading or whatever it would have been called would have would have been there. And uh, and then also near me as well, there's a place called um, the Goring Gap, and you hear about this and you, you don't really know what it is. It is you know, where the river passes through the Chiltern Hills and it just gradually eroded its way through the chalk of the Chiltern Hills to where it flows now. And, um, and also knowing as well that you know, the River Thames used to be further north. You know, it's thanks to you know, ice ages and glaciers that it's, it's moved to where it is now. So if it wasn't for those, those glaciers, River Thames wouldn't even be here. And there, you know, there wouldn't be a reading. 
Um, yeah, who, who knows? Being aware of that and uh, the knock-on effects of that, it's, uh, it's like, yeah, dramatic changes, but this is geological time and the impact of, of those, those shifts and those, those changes. Yeah, and that's, that uh, just really kind of, yeah, fascinated me. I, I know more about, about where I live that adds to the, the the beauty of it for me. And, and I guess, yeah, it helps me feel um, like I belong. Um, Reading was the first place where I really felt rooted. This adds to my, to my rootedness, just knowing that, and it adds to my, my caring for the, for the place. We've already touched on the role that the Mad Duck Cafe and Mandy and Donna have played in supporting Richard's dreams and efforts. But if it were up to Richard, I think we'd say a bit more. And I'll leave it up to Anna to explain. And I think one of the things that is really great about you is the sense of the need to lift others up. And you being a connector, you being mm. a weaver, you, you you talk a lot about other people. That's one thing that we noticed when we first started chatting mm. with you is you uh, you talk about yourself, but you also bring in all the people around you too. And one of the people that you mentioned earlier just briefly but you've talked very very highly of it in the past is Mandy and her support of the work that you're doing and how how critical her influence on the community has been and we would love to to give Mandy a little bit of a spotlight when I think of of Mandy it's it's Donna as well it was Mandy and Donna sitting in one of their houses on a rainy afternoon and they just had this this dream to to set up a, a cafe, a village cafe to yeah help recreate what they remembered. People connect with each other and looking after each other. So it was the yeah it was the two of them together, and they both bring different things. That uh, Mandy is very much you know the the front of the house, loves speaking to people. She's very creative. She's very artistic. Uh, she can whip up a beautiful creative sign for something you just mentioned to her she runs with things and um yeah and donna is you know person who you know prefers to be in the in the kitchen cooking she's uh yeah she's the uh yeah the quieter more sort of introverted person and um yeah both both with big hearts yeah they they created this dream together it was a social club and an empty building out the back and they just transformed it into, um, I'm going to say, an, an oasis. Just when you walk in down this side alley at the back of this building, you walk into the garden and just all of the the fun that's there. I took one of my clients there recently and was showing him the stuff in the garden. And you can see there's an old pair of jeans, you know, that they filled with soil and you've got plants growing out this old pair of jeans. And... There's, there's so much more stuff like that. There's, there's fun and there's beauty. There's the beautiful meadow at the back that overlooks the River Thames. And when you walk inside, it's, um, it's like home. Big armchairs, sofas, books. You feel welcomed as soon as you walk in. Yeah, and they, they created something so special out of so very little. They both put you know, money into it. They they weren't expecting to get anything out of it. That wasn't important to to it. You know, they were connected to their values. It was more important for them to um help other people to uh, to recreate that sense of, of village. Yeah, they are two very, very special people. And um yeah, if they weren't if they weren't there, then um early sustainability group wouldn't have started. And to finish things off, Richard shared a bit about his dreams for the future, which gives us a glimpse of, of what it takes to really set the scene for us to come together to regenerate our places. How do I help deepen the connection of people to place? On the River Thames, there's a, there's a, you know, a lock to help with the navigation and helping boats go up the rising gradients of the Thames and uh, there's an old disused cafe there where it's it's been closed for about four years. I, I remember going when it was open and now it's just locked gates and it's just dilapidating and, and the whole area is 
degraded and um and thinking about bioregional learning centers and helping people to connect more with where they live and inspired by other people it's just and also within pearly sustainability group people having talked about you know the fond memories of this lock i guess it's that that energy that connection people had of taking their their children there when the cafe was open and it's been such a beautiful place that it's important to people i just see the huge potential in um yeah in in regenerating this place and um regenerating connections between all different ages um and reconnecting people more with um yeah with 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 the river thames um people people live there because it's a beautiful place uh some people know quite a bit about it um others others don't at all and like, there's there's so much more potential i know from how it's enriched my life knowing more about where i live and and i'm yeah i'm passionate to um yeah, see whether this this place allows people to yeah to deepen their connection to where they live and and with with each other as well and um and so grateful for uh for hearing about community art mm-hmm. yeah just cheering uh claire atwell and uh and noticing an, you know another local artist here who was brilliant at bringing people together organizing an arts festival and uh and her um, being inspired by the vision and uh, creating some slides with me about this this lock and the and the potential. And Richard shared with us a few closing thoughts. It's my um, my mental models is actually thinking if you go upstream, you know, you, you change those those mental models. Um, you know, you discover act, you discover you know regenerative thinking, you know, systems thinking, bioregional thinking. Don't focus on problems, focus on potential. You, know, you suddenly start behaving differently in the world. And everything flows from that uh, downstream. So for our listeners who want to follow along or are interested in the work that you're doing, do you have any places that they can go to learn more about your work or anything that's happening in Pearly on Thames? Check out pearlysustainabilitygroup.co.uk for more details of uh, what we've been doing and in the pro-social spaces, pro-social world, pro-social commons. Curious about ACT? Come and join me in the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science. Yeah, those, those, those are the places where I belong and uh, where you're, you'll find me sort of, um, yeah, wandering around and... Um, yeah, feeling uh, feeling connected and and alive. Um, yeah, come and find me there. Come and come and find me in the UK bioregional community of practice. If you're in the UK and you're you're passionate about um, yeah bioregioning, and uh, yeah, come to the come to the Mad Duck uh, Cafe. There you um, go. Yeah, meet uh, meet Mandy and Donna and uh, and everyone else there great conversation always good to hang out with you yeah thank you both of you for you know as well uh haven't had this conversation with anyone else and uh thank you for um yeah what you got me to really uh, yeah bring out bring out of me and my my experiences my my context um, i'm very grateful for your your questions your um yeah your values your energy and um the connection we have so thank you of course yeah see you see you downstream see you downstream <laughs> keep on swimming thanks for listening if you're feeling a jolt of inspiration if you'd like to support anna and me in our ongoing efforts to tell these stories you can donate to us on our patreon at awakening lands links for all this can be found in the show notes thanks and please tell your landscape We said hello.